Hi everybody. Uh, today's lecture is going to start the series on the idea of momentum and later on collisions. And along the way we'll talk about something called impulse and the impulse momentum theorem. So momentum, what is it anyways? Um, you often hear that word momentum, you know, people have a lot of momentum, somebody's gaining momentum, so it always seems to have something to do with the idea of motion. But momentum is more than just motion itself. Turns out momentum is the product of an object's mass and its motion, its mass and its velocity. Okay, so that makes it pretty easy to calculate. So the formula for momentum that we use is P equals MV. Okay. Uh, the letter P is the symbol for momentum, a lowercase p. And the units of momentum, well there's two. There's the kilogram meter per second. Now that unit just comes from masses in kilograms and velocity in meters per second. But another unit more commonly used, and the one I like to use, is the Newton second. Newton, the idea of force, and uh, seconds, the idea of time. Uh, so again, either unit, though, is considered to be acceptable. If momentum is the product of mass and velocity, well, we've seen mass and velocity together in another formula, kinetic energy. So there must be some sort of relationship here between momentum and kinetic energy. And basically what it's saying is that any object with momentum automatically has kinetic energy because it means it's in motion. Or any object with kinetic energy must also have momentum because both of them imply motion. But they're not equal. So let's look at an example. So here I have a 1,000 kilogram truck traveling along at 5 meters per second. And I've got a 500 kilogram car traveling along at some unknown velocity. Now what I want to explore here is Let's say I want the momentum of the truck to equal the momentum of the car. Okay, well, momentum is mass times velocity. So we've got there each mass times each velocity it has to be equal, right? So we'll just plug in some numbers. Truck is 1,000 going at 5. Car is 500 going at some velocity we don't know. So 5,000 divide through, and we end up with car needs to go at 10 meters per second. Okay, well that almost kind of obvious, right? Because the truck had twice the mass of the car, so the car better have twice the velocity of the truck in order for their momenta, a plural momentum, uh, to be equal. Pretty easy, right? Now, but are their kinetic energies equal? Just because their momenta are equal does not necessarily mean their kinetic energies are equal. In fact, let's look at that. Kinetic energy, of course, is 1 half mv squared. So for the truck, kinetic energy would be 1 half its mass, 1,000, times its velocity, 5 squared. That gives you 12,500 joules of kinetic energy for the truck. For the car, its kinetic energy would be 1 half its mass, 500, times its velocity, 10 squared. That gives me, oh, surprisingly, 25,000 joules. Notice that even though their momenta are equal, the car had twice the kinetic energy, in this case, of the truck. Now why? Well, that velocity. Well, velocity is a squared value, so the greater the velocity when you square it means a much larger answer at the end. So that's why the car really ends up, even though it has a lower mass, due to its much higher velocity and that you square that, a much higher kinetic energy number. Now along with the idea of momentum comes something called an impulse. Now the term impulse, if you heard the term impulsive, means to sort of act without thinking or act quickly in a way. And impulse in physics has kind of a similar notation. Impulses involve applying a force for a certain amount of time. And again, that kind of gives us a formula here. The formula for impulse is I, which stands for impulse, is the product of force and time. So let's look at that. So the units of impulse are the newton second. Again, looking because force is in newtons and times in seconds. But it can also be the kilogram meter per second. 
Now, wait a minute, we just saw that momentum is also kilogram meter per second, or also newton seconds. So, what happens when units sort of match out? Well, that means there's some sort of relationship that must occur here. And that's where something called the impulse momentum theorem comes in, which says this. Any impulse causes a change in an object's momentum. So, we can't simply say impulse and momentum are the same. We can't exactly interchange them, because that word change is in there. So what that means is that the impulse is equal to the change in momentum, or the change in mass times velocity. So that change is a very important factor, don't forget that. But there's kind of a bigger meaning to this, and I want to really look at that. So let's take this impulse momentum theorem and do a little substituting. Now, as we just saw, impulse is the product of force and time. Momentum is the product of mass and velocity. So where impulse is, I'm going to put force times time. And where momentum is, I'm going to put mass times velocity. I have to leave that change, that delta symbol there. Now, if you think about it, mass and velocity. Mass tends to not change very much. It can, but in this case, we're going to pretend it's not. So I'm going to bring the mass out and just focus on the change in velocity part. Now, change in velocity. Well, any change is a final minus initial. So I can rewrite this as final velocity minus initial. Now I'm going to do something that might seem completely random. I'm going to divide both sides by time so that I can cancel my time on this side. And so now I have something that looks like this. Force is equal to mass times final velocity minus initial all over time. Well, wait. Final velocity minus initial, that's change in velocity. And change in velocity over time is, oh, what is that? Acceleration. Oh, look what we just did. So impulse momentum is actually not something new. Turns out impulse momentum is really Newton's second law of motion. Um, so that's kind of comforting because now it's just simply a different way of approaching something that we've done many times before. So let's look at an example that we saw a long time ago when we did forces, and I'm going to sort of bring it back again. And that's the idea of a little baseball game going. So I've got my pitcher, and I've got my batter. Pitcher is going to pitch the ball in at 30 meters per second. The batter is going to swing, make contact for 0.3 seconds, sending it back the other way at the pitcher at 20 meters per second. And so I'd like to know the change in momentum of the ball due to the bat, the impulse the bat applies to the ball, and the amount of force the bat applies to the ball. Okay, so let's look at change in momentum. Change in momentum, change in mass times velocity, well, again, the mass is not going to change. It's going to be the velocity that changes. So we have the mass times final velocity minus initial. Oop, wait a minute, we've got to think about something. Velocity is a vector, which means if velocity is a vector, momentum must also be a vector. Okay? So we've got to keep in mind our direction. See, the ball comes in at 30 but is hit back the other way, so that's actually negative 20 meters per second. So the change in momentum would be the mass of the ball, 0.4, final velocity of negative 20 minus an initial velocity of 30, and that gives me a change in momentum of negative 20 newton seconds. Again, it makes sense that it's negative because the change is applied in the negative direction. The batter is swinging in the negative direction. Okay, so let's get impulse. Well, turns out there's really nothing to getting impulse because the impulse is equal to the change in momentum, which is also negative 20. Okay, the impulse momentum theorem, they are equal to each other. 
So the impulse is what's delivered by the bat, and that should also be done in the negative direction, which means impulse is also a vector. Now to get force. Well, now that I know the impulse, and impulse is force times time, and I have an impulse of negative 20 applied for 0.3 seconds, and that gives me a force of negative 66.7 newtons. And again, that kind of makes sense. The force is acting in the negative direction because that's the direction the bat is being swung. So that's one way I could have done this. Now, I could go back to the old ways of doing things and done this in reverse. I could have used motion, linear motion, to find acceleration to then find force. And once I knew force and time, I'd know the impulse. And once I knew the impulse, I used the change in momentum. So that's the nice thing. We can now approach problems from many different perspectives. Here's a little more complicated example. Let's say I've got a uh, crate sitting up here on the top of a four meter high ramp. It's got 100 kilograms of mass. It slides down, we'll assume no friction, and crashes into a wall coming to a stop in 0.6 seconds. I want to know the impulse applied to the crate and the amount of force applied to the crate. Now, though it starts from rest and ends at rest, we can't use zero velocities for both to try to figure out change in momentum because that wouldn't make any sense. You see, the change in momentum occurs here at the wall because that's when the force is applied. So I want to find the impulse, but since I don't know force, I need to focus on the change in momentum, the change in mass times velocity. Again, the mass of the crate isn't going to change, but its velocity will. So the impulse would be the mass, final velocity, minus initial. Now, the initial velocity is not zero. You see, the crate is in motion right before it crashes. So what I need to know is I need to know what is the velocity right here before the crash. Now, how am I going to do that? Well, let's go back to our old pal energy. See, at the top of the ramp, do I have height? Yes. Do I have motion? No. Is there a spring? No. So I know I'm starting off with gravitational potential energy. And then down here along the ground, do I have height? No. Do I have velocity? Yes. So my total energy down here is kinetic. And since I said no friction, we can assume that total energy equals total energy. The potential at the top becomes kinetic at the bottom. Potential is mgh, kinetic is one-half mv squared. I can do my little canceling of mass here because it's on both sides. So it starts off with a height of 4 meters. Multiply it by 2. And when I take the square root, I find out the crate is going 8.9 meters per second right before the crash. Okay. Now, Although that was the velocity at the end of the ramp, it's the initial velocity of the crate before the crash. Because after the crash, that 100 kilogram crate comes to a stop from 8.9 meters per second. So that gives us an impulse of 890 newton seconds. Now that I know the impulse, I can actually find the force of the crash. Because impulse is force times time. 890 newtons of impulse applied for 0.6 seconds gives a force of 1,483.3 newtons. And that's all there is to it. So notice we had to apply a little conservation of energy to find out a velocity, but once we knew that we were able to pretty easily figure out everything else. Now let's look at a more graphical example of how impulse and momentum actually sort of work together here. So for example, what I've got here is a 200 kilogram filing cabinet uh, that our little mover here is going to move. And this is going to show us the amount of force applied and the velocity of the cart itself, of the cabinet itself. So here we go. So we're applying 20 newtons of force. And notice that 20 newtons is continual. But the velocity is not constant, it's changing as it should. 
because we are applying an impulse, a force, over time. And as time gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the velocity grows larger and larger and larger. So somewhere here around 20 seconds or so, we reach a velocity of 2 meters per second. Okay, so under a force of 20 newtons, after 20 seconds, we got to a velocity of about 2 meters per second for this 200 kilogram mass. So let's change things around a little bit. I'm going to double my force to about 40 newtons. And let's see what happens here. Okay, so now I've got a continual 40 newtons applied, but notice that the change in velocity is occurring at a much higher rate. And in fact, now we're going to hit that 2 meters per second right here at about 10 seconds. And that, of course, should make sense. I doubled the force, which doubled the impulse. However, the change in momentum ended up being the same because it took half the amount of time to reach that final velocity. But there's a lot more involved in it than that. If I kind of look at this graph, notice I have a graph of force here in newtons versus time here in seconds. Now, if we remember our rules about graphing, if I'm not looking for force or time, there are two other things that I always sort of want to think about. Slope and area. Now, the slope of this line is zero, okay, because it's flat. So slope's really not going to tell me anything anyways. And in fact, if I were to take slope, the units of my slope would be the newton per second. And newton per second right now doesn't really mean anything to me. But what if I took area? This area right here for this whole 20 seconds, okay? Well, it's 20 newtons high and 20 seconds long. So the area there would be 20 newtons times 20 seconds, which will give me 400 newton seconds. 400 newton seconds. Well, newton seconds must be impulse, right? Okay, so that's important, that the area under a force time graph will give me an impulse. But if it gives me an impulse, then it also must give me my change in momentum. Okay, well, let's see if that works. If we look down here at the bottom graph of velocity, okay, well, my change in momentum would be my change in mass times velocity. Now, the mass was constant. Okay. And the mass was a 200 kilogram cabinet. The final velocity at the end of 20 seconds is 2 meters per second. And it began from rest. And what does that give me? 400 newton seconds. So it works. The area under a force time graph gives me impulse, which also gives me the change in momentum. If I look at this next graph, well, this area here is 40 by 10. So that area is still the impulse and is still 400 newton seconds. But my change in momentum, well, again, I start with 0 meters per second and go up to 2 with a mass of 200. And so my change in momentum is still 400 newton seconds. So it still works. So again, that's another way to find out the idea of impulse or change in momentum. If I'm given a force time graph, taking the area under a force time graph gives me impulse, and if I knew impulse, I automatically know change in momentum. Okay, so just to recap, we have the idea of momentum, the product of mass and velocity. We have the idea of an impulse, which is the product of a force applied for a certain amount of time, and the impulse momentum theorem that any impulse applied to an object also equals the change in momentum of the object. All right, that'll do it for today. See you next time.